Uh, good evening, good afternoon, class. Uh, I want to apologize for having this posted so late. Uh, for some reason, my mic on my laptop uh, screwed up. Um, somehow the settings got reset so that it was mute, even though it was saying it wasn't mute. So I am uploading this uh, here. It is uh, just before noon on Saturday morning. Uh, so when you get this, um, more than likely you'll be watching it via YouTube because it probably will not be posted to iTunes U until Monday. Um, now, today's lecture will be on the Reformation. Now, last class period we had a really good discussion about the Renaissance and how the Renaissance opened the doorway to questioning in the lives of Europeans. This is something that we often take for granted in Western society. This act of being able to question those around us, to question um, our religion, to question our state, um, to question the government, just to question in general, to question your professor, for example. The Middle Ages were a time period of, of rigid social authority by today's standards. You did not have the right to openly question those above you. Uh, to do so risk punishment or even death. So opening the doorway to questioning in the, refer in the Renaissance would mean that Europeans started to question uh, the world around them. They started to question their perception of the world, what was important in their world. Like during our discussion we talked about how those that were involved in the Renaissance started to focus on more secular attitudes, more things things to do with the world rather than things to do with uh, the spiritual world or religion. Um, and since religion was so central to Europeans' lives at this time, it was probably by no coincidence that questioning of religious authority preceded questioning of, of secular authority and, and what we will see by the end of this class. Now to understand the Reformation, we have to go back to looking at the institutional church. Because one of the things that is kind of unnerving about lecturing about this is it's very easy to offend people when, when discussing the Reformation. And one of the things that I want to make clear is a lot of what we're going to be talking about in this class is about the church, the Catholic Church, as an institution, not as a religion, but as an institution because the Catholic Church at this time, and even to some degree today, but especially here in around 1500, is just as much an institution, a hierarchy, a corporation, if you will, as it is a religion. Uh, so to understand the Reformation, we have to understand, be sure to understand, the role of the church. Now, early on, when Christianity was first developing, before it was the official religion of, of uh, the, the Roman Empire, Christians held various beliefs as we talked about. The Arians, for example, who argued that Jesus Christ was more like a uh, Greek demigod rather than the Son of God. However, by the time of Constantine, by the 300s, If the church was going to be, if the Christian religion was going to be the official religion of the Roman Empire, men like Constantine wanted it to be uniform and standardized. And as a result, uh, Christian leaders instituted a hierarchy of church officials in order to maintain this standardization. So even before the Great Schism of 1054, you have patriarchs and archbishops and cardinals and priests. And as Rome grew, as the the church in Rome grew and grew in Constantinople. So did the the sort of the the institution of the church itself. And as Rome, for example, this the city itself collapsed, the only institution that was left providing guidance in Western Europe was the church. So the church naturally took on characteristics that are normally reserved for governments. Now, let's look at the evolution of Christian ideals and Christian beliefs. 
325 AD, uh, we see the uh, expelling, the declaring of, of dissenting opinions to be heresy, like the Arians. We see the issuing of the Nicene Creed, which standardized Christianity. And by the 1500s, the Roman Catholic Church was both a unifying force and a secular power in its own right. And again, I need to stress more than anything that this is an institution, not just a religion. Now, we start to see the church start to fragment very early on. In 1054, we see the question of Caesaropapism in the East and Petrine doctrine or papal supremacy in the West coming to loggerheads. Uh, this is combined with smaller issues of celibacy in the ranks of the clergy, uh, the role of icons or like stained glass windows or relics, and more secular matters like territorial disputes, leading to the splitting away of the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. They basically split from each other, and depending on which side you talk to, um, one split from the other, or the Catholics split from the Orthodox, or the Orthodox split from the Catholics. But by 1054, you have two distinct versions of Christianity. You have Catholicism in the West and Orthodoxy in the East. And so between 1054 and 1400, the Church had struggled with keeping it unified. And this will explain, in some respect, elements within the Catholic Church being so hard line in terms of holding believers rigidly accountable to Catholic dogma. But where does this split that we're going to talk about today originate? Well, in a lot of ways, it originates with the Second Schism, or the Western Schism, that happens between 1378 and 1418. We talked about this in class, about how you had at one time two popes, and then finally three popes. This all comes out of the question of papal power versus secular authority, because remember in 1378, Philip IV of France ordered his troops to capture the, the pope, and in doing so, they killed the, 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 reign, the sitting pope. The new pope would be a pro-French pope and move the, the papacy to Avignon, France, just south of Paris. And then, in 1378, you would have the election of two popes. You would have an Avignon pope and a Roman pope. And so... This was attempt. They attempted to solve this with the Council of Pisa, with the election of a new pope, and you get three popes. And this is finally solved in 1418 with uh, the Council of Constance, where those three popes are told leave, quit, resign, uh, and a new pope is elected. Now, during this time, during this time period of the Western Schism you have the rise of a new clerical class. Not, not clergy, but a clerical class of secular scholars. These are men who serve in the new universities that are born of the scholastic movement of the late Middle Ages. They're men like John Wycliffe of the University of Oxford and Jan Hus of the University of Prague. These are men who deal in secular subjects like math, and astronomy, but also deal in religious matters as well. Religion and scholarship are still intertwined at this time. So during the time period of the Western Schism, these men debated with their fellow scholastics, debated the issues and the policies of the two and then the three popes. And when the church officially heals itself, it doesn't mean that the divisions between these scholars are healed. Because, for example, John Wycliffe argued that the papacy, the church, had become too rich, too centered on worldly affairs, 
and that the only way to get rid of what he called the imperial papacy was for the church to divest itself of its wealth, to live in poverty like the majority of Europeans. And Wycliffe had his own followers in England. These were known as the Lollards. Now, of course, in attacking the wealth of the church, this attacked individuals in, in the church as well. Because you've got to think of this this way. You have people serving in the church, and they're quite comfortable in their lofty positions of spiritual power, but also worldly power and worldly wealth. And so this is a direct attack on these individuals. So the Lollards will become a persecuted minority in uh, England. At the same time, Jan Hus, who was a scholar at the University of Prague, both argued that the church needed to divest itself of its wealth, but also argued that it needed to, to divest itself of its, its uh, worldly power, to not get involved in the mixing of religion and politics, to stay out of secular affairs. Now, Hus will be put on trial by, um, by the papacy for heresy, found guilty, and burned at the stakes around, I believe, 1415. Now, the execution of Jan Hus will not solve the matter because this will cause the outbreak of what becomes known as the Hussite Wars in what is today the Czech Republic. The believers of Hus, the Hussites, will rebel. And these are not only peasants, but also low-level nobles. And they will win. One of the ways they win are using what are known as vagabond tactics, or wagon-born tactics. Vagabond tactics are illustrated by this diorama that's here on the screen. Basically, they used a modern or a, or a medieval form of tank. They would armor wagons with heavy timbers. And when they met uh, supporters of the higher nobility and the church, they would circle the wagons and defend themselves. Now at this time, it was considered dishonorable to give up the field of battle. So once engaged, you fought. And so the enemies, enemies of the Hussites would be, would be forced by their honor to engage the Hussites mobile fort, if you will. And while they would be engaged in one, on one side of the fort, the Hussites would spill out the back, or the opposite side, and attack the flanks of the enemy force. They would oftentimes uh, scare off the infantry, they would corner the, no the noble knights, and they would slaughter them, and they would do this consistently. And so, they won. And one of the things that the Hussites won was not only more political autonomy in what is today the Czech Republic, but more importantly, when it came to their religion, the Hussites won the right to appoint their own priest. At, you know, even today in the Catholic Church, priests are assigned by the diocese, which is the division of the Catholic Church here in the United States. You have a local uh, bishop of a diocese who will appoint clergy to the various posts within his uh, within his uh, diocese. Well, not here in the Czech Republic. The, the Czechs or the Hussites won the right to appoint their own clergy, appoint their own priest. So you can almost look at the Lollards, you know, the followers of Wycliffe and the Hussites as proto-Protestants because Protestantism really doesn't take off until the work of this man. This is Martin Luther. Now, the interesting thing that I need to stress is most of the people who initiate the Protestant Reformation are Catholic clergy. Martin Luther was a priest in Saxony, what is today uh, part of Germany, and Martin Luther believed that he was defending Catholicism initially, not attacking it. In 1517, Martin Luther uh, had, a, had a problem. Um, up until that time, the clergy, especially the high clergy, the, the upper officials of the church, 
made it a common practice to sell indulgences. Now, what is an indulgence? An indulgence starts out as a way for a believer to wash away their sins. Because according to Catholic theology, one must redeem oneself through good works. So if you sin, you're supposed to go to confession regularly, confess your sins to the priest, make that public to God, and then the priest will tell you how you can, you can wash this sin away. You can take care of the poor, you can um, help with the sick, you can do good deeds. Now an indulgence is a way of, I hate to put it this way, but a way of anticipating sin. Leaders would often go and ask for indulgences if they knew they were going to war. When the Crusades were uh, first called by Pope Urban II, Pope Urban II basically issued a blanket indulgence for all the Crusaders who went on crusade, anticipating um, the violence and the atrocities of the Crusades. Now, in both cases, leaders would oftentimes make the excuse we're too busy to actually carry out these good deeds. And what evolved was they would pay the, the church. They would say, here, I'm going to give you some money. You take care of the poor. You take care of the sick. I'm, my good deed is allowing you to do this. However, like with any institution, when you introduce large amounts of money, temptation gets in the way. And what has happened by the early 1500s is that uh, the high church officials, like the Archbishop of Mainz, which was Martin Luther's boss, was selling indulgences in order to complete his new uh, cathedral. Even the Pope at this time, I believe it is Pope Leo X, was selling indulgences in order to fund the construction of St. Peter's Basilica. And so Martin Luther was quite perturbed about this. He was quite mad about it. He believed this was a corruption of the Catholic faith. So Martin Luther went to the cathedral in Mainz and nailed 95 complaints, his so-called 95 thesis, on the front door. Now this is an open attack, not only on indulgences, but on those issuing the indulgences. So in effect, Martin Luther is attacking the church. He's attacking the church officials. And so in 1520, Pope Leo X excommunicates Martin Luther. However, Luther is protected by the time period that he's in. If this had happened two or three hundred years beforehand, Luther may have been arrested, put on trial, and executed. However, because of inventions like the printing press, because of, in, because of the spread of his protest movement, hint, hence the name Protestantism, Martin Luther could not be just summarily done away with. The church wanted to avoid another Hussite war. So in 1521, Luther is called before the Diet of Worms. Now, Worms is a city in Germany, and Diet basically means conference. So this isn't a, a new Diet plan. This is a conference called by the church, where you have high church officials representing Pope Leo X. But you also have people representing Charles V, who was Holy Roman Emperor, but also he was King of Spain and the King or the Emperor of Austria. So Luther is called to basically defend his views. Now, what happens? To understand what happens, we have to understand the Holy Roman Empire, because this is where religion and politics start to mix. The Holy Roman Empire, as you can see by this illustration on the screen, was a fragmented collection of semi-independent principalities. Now, nominally, the Holy Roman Empire was controlled by an emperor, the Holy Roman Emperor. However, the power of the Holy Roman Emperor 
was dependent upon how popular he was among the various princes of the German principalities. Now, Charles V was not even German. He was Spanish. He was the son of a Austrian of the Austrian house, the Austrian king. So he's a little bit German and a Catholic mother. So he is the king of Spain. He is the reigning monarch of Austria, which is this area right here in green, this big place right here. But the Austrian Empire also extends beyond this. If you don't ask, it's get the politics of this gets very confusing. We'll talk about this if you want to in class. But just understand that part of the Austrian Empire is also part of the Holy Roman Empire. And as such, Charles V is not only an elector of the Holy Roman em Emperor, he is a candidate for the Holy, Romper, Holman, Holy, Romper, Holy Roman Emperorship. <laughs> now, this doesn't mean that he is a pop popular Holy Roman Emperor. Men like Frederick III, Elector of Saxony, right here in pink, this area right here. Frederick is not uh, a fan of Charles V. He is a political opponent of Charles V. He argues that he is a foreigner, that he's not even German. And of course, Frederick has support, but Charles V has more support. Not only does Charles V have support of the princes here in the lower part of Germany, he, as the protector of the Catholic faith, as King of Spain, King of Austria and Holy Roman Emperor, he has the ear of the Pope. So the German princes who oppose Charles V don't, do not want to openly challenge Charles V because they fear, well, excommunication. They fear the, this kind of retribution. However, what would happen if their principalities were not Catholic? What happens if the people who serve them were not Catholic? Well, if they were excommunicated, it would only mean that the leaders outside of their principalities considered them heretics, not their own subjects. Now, the real danger of excommunication is not that somebody from outside of your kingdom or lands thinks of you as a heretic. It's that the people that have sworn loyalty to you are no longer loyal to you because the excommunication order has deemed you, well, a servant of Satan, a heretic. So, Frederick III is there at the Diet of Worms. He is the, the secular lord of where Martin Luther is from. And so, Frederick III basically says, leave him to me. I'll imprison, imprison him in one of my castles and he'll be out of your hair. Well, Frederick has an ulterior motive. Frederick is going to not imprison him in the dungeon of a castle. Instead, he's going to put him in Wartburg Castle under house arrest. But he's going to live in one of the finest rooms and Frederick is going to bring to the castle two or three printing presses so that while the spirit, while the letter of the law is being carried out, Martin Luther is in prison, he's under house arrest, the spirit of the law is pretty much broken because Frederick III is going to allow Martin Luther to continue to think, continue to write, and continue to publish and disseminate his ideas and spread these outside of Saxony and continue to spread the Lutheran religion, the Lutheran, uh, Lutheran Protestant faith. Now Lutheranism is not the only Protestant faith that is cropping up at this time. You also have the beliefs of the Swiss uh, Swiss cleric Ulrich Zwingli. Now Zwingli agreed with Luther in that there was corruption in the church. He wrote his own 67 complaints or 67 theses uh, com basically complaining about the abuses of indulgences and corruption within the church. But Zwingli argues that the church is a voluntary conglomeration of believers. It should not have its own hierarchy. Instead, it should be managed by local authorities, not by, you know, a supra, you know, supra encompassing hierarchy like the Catholic religion has, 
but instead controlled at the local level, but by local political or secular authorities. This puts him at odds not only with people outside of Switzerland, but um, outside of, well, not, not just outside of Switzerland, but inside of Switzerland, in, even inside where he is living, which is Geneva and Zurich. And so in 1531, Zwingli is killed in what is known as the Zurich War, which is part of the uh, civil war that's fought in Switzerland during this time period. Again, at the same time that you have Luther and Zwingli, you have another group called the Anabaptist. Now, the Anabaptist will reject any formal church organization. Anabaptist will encompass several different groups, and these groups argue that this is a organization of individuals that should all be equal within the church, voluntarily being part of the church, and that there, should, there is no need for a hierarchy to impose its will. The church should naturally evolve from those people within the church. Now, there is a small group that is in what is today Holland, the Dutch Anabaptist, which kind of break with this convention. They agree that there should be no church formal, formal church organization, but they argue that Catholics should be forcefully converted to this view, that Anabaptists should attack the existing church. And as a result, both the church, the, the Catholic church, and secular authorities in the Low Countries will attack and suppress the Anabaptist revolt. The violence of this suppression will lead to the other Anabaptists to swear off violence in any form. And so we get the birth of the modern day Amish. The Amish trace their roots back to this Anabaptist uh, sect of Christianity, of Protestantism, and the fact that part of the Anabaptist faith, the church, took up violence, was suppressed, failed. And so the rest of the Anabaptists become pacifist. They swear off any form of violence whatsoever. Now, in England, you have the you have the the cleric John Calvin. Calvin will convert to Protestantism in the 1530s, and he will move to Switzerland to found a model Protestant community. Now, while Calvin again agrees with Luther by this time, because Luther by the 1530s has basically said that the Catholic Church uh, is not the true faith, that transubstination, trans which is the belief that uh, during Mass, during the Lord's Supper, the bread and wine given uh, is literally transformed into the body and blood of Christ. Luther said that's there's no way that can happen. Uh, Luther by this time is arguing that instead the only way to get to heaven is not through good deeds, not through mass, not through the Lord's Supper, but instead by faith alone. Justification by faith. That the only way people will come to the Lord is by truly believing in the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now Calvin subscribes to these beliefs of Lutheranism. However, he adds one other facet that sets Calvinists apart from Lutherans. And this is the belief in predestination. Because Calvin argued that God is all-knowing. God is all-powerful. And since God is omniscient, he knows the present, but he also knows the future. He has already pre-selected those that are going to heaven, the elect, according to Calvin, and those that are going to hell. And of course, according to Calvin, the vast majority of people are not going to heaven. Now the question for Calvinist is, how do you know you're one of the elect? You don't get issued a little membership card as a member of the elect. Calvin argued that the elect would naturally want to act like Christians that the elect would naturally be the holiest and most pious people in, a com in the community. 
and this would greatly influence the Protestant faith of Presbyterianism. But other Protestants don't believe in this idea of predestination. They argue that this destroys the whole aspect of free will and that man is set apart from the beast of the fields because of free will. So, a post-Calvinist thinker, a fellow by the name of Jacob Hermenison, argued that instead, instead of predestination, believers have to experience God. They have to experience a salvation conversion that we are all sinners and we are all damned to hell from the day that we are born and that only by having this salvation experience can somebody become a Christian, become saved, and be uh, let into heaven. So it is Jacob Hermenison's beliefs that are those that are under that are undergirding those of Methodism because John Wesley was profoundly influenced by Hermenison's thought. Wesley is the founder of the Methodist faith. And so, you know, you have the Catholic faith that once you're baptized in the, into the church, once you go to confession, do good works, works, you will be saved. Calvin or Luther believes that you must have faith alone without the belief in uh, um, confession or good works. Calvin argues that, yes, you must do this, but you also have to be one of the elect. Only the elect are going to be the ones that want, naturally want to do this. And then finally, Hermeneson and, and Wesley argue that, that no, no, a person has to become a Christian. That we are not Christians when we are born. We are not Christians if we are baptized as babies. We have to come to Christ. And of course, many people in this area are Baptist. And of course, Baptist, Bab, the Baptist faith is an outgrowth of the Methodist faith. So by the 1530s, Europe looks pretty much like this. And I apologize for the, the Lutheran and Roman Catholic colors because it's really hard for you to see them. But the darker yellow here, in Sax, where Saxony and the Holy Roman Empire is right here, and going down here into Austria. This is where Lutheranism becomes prominent in the 1530s and 1540s. The rest that you see here in Italy, in the southern part of Europe, in France, and especially Spain, this is dominated by the Catholic faith. You also have here in blue and sort of a light green, you have the Calvinist influenced areas. As you can see, they're intermixed here in France. And as we will talk about next class period, when we talk about the rise of Elizabeth I, you have a new religion, uh, the Anglican, or Church of England, here in England. Well, so what's the Catholic response? Well, the Catholic response is divided, because on the one side you have moderates within the Catholic Church who want to bring Protestants back into the fold by addressing their, their complaints, addressing their, 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 their problems. Uh, for example, this reconciliation movement will try and stress the revival of old orders, orders of monks and nuns, uh, to, to strengthen the religion and provide uh, guidance and to provide services uh, such as orphanages and education for the girls. They also call the Council of Trent. Now at the Council of Trent it condemns simony. doesn't condemn indulgences but it condemns simony. Simony is the selling of church offices for money. However the Council of Trent is also partially dominated by hardliners. And if you hear that buzzing in the background, that's my dryer going off, so I apologize. These hardliners do not want to give any consideration or compromise or compromise with the, the Protestants. Instead, they call for greater church discipline. As a result, 
they helped found the Society of Jesus. The Society of Jesus was founded by Ignatius Leola. The Society of Jesus is better known as the Jesuit Order. Now the Jesuits will become a central feature of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. The Catholic Counter-Reformation will come in two different waves. The first phase of the Catholic Counter-Reformation is that the Jesuit Order will build schools for religious instruction. Basically, Ignatius Leola argues that the reason why Protestantism has been allowed to flourish is because believers do not fully understand the Catholic faith and that the Jesuits will provide education in order to maintain church discipline. However, the Jesuits will also play a central feature in what becomes known as the Inquisition. Now, the Inquisition is nothing new in Western Europe. The Spanish Inquisition was used after the Reconquista, after the Moors, the Muslim Moors, were thrown out of Spain. The Inquisition was used to hunt down these infidels, to catch them, to find out who they were, and to either forcefully convert them or to expel or execute them. And so the Roman Catholic Church will adopt the methods of the Spanish Inquisition, this is otherwise known as the Roman Inquisition, to be used against Protestants throughout Europe. And again, Jesuit monks will be at the center of this. So what are the political implications? Well, Protestantism will accelerate the breakdown of the feudal system. Because feudalism needs a unified church. In the feudal system, you have to be able to take a feudal oath to somebody of the same faith. It's, it's almost impossible to take a feudal oath if you're Catholic and the person under you is, say, Lutheran or vice versa. And so the feudal system starts to tear itself apart just as the church is tearing itself apart. As we saw with the case of Frederick the Elector of Saxony, local lords are going to use they're going to use Protestantism as a political tool against their lords, against central authority. This will come to a head in 1555 with the Peace of Augsburg. The Peace of Augsburg is an attempt to to head off war before it occurs because you already have small little brush fire wars breaking out throughout Europe like the Peasants War. The Peace of Augsburg simply states this that the religion of a land, a religion of a kingdom will be determined by the secular lord of that land. So the king of, of Spain will determine that Spain is Catholic. The king of France will determine whether France is either Protestant or Huguenot or Catholic. But there's a problem with the Peace of Augsburg. The main problem again goes back to here. Right here. The Holy Roman Empire. Because as I told you before, the Holy Roman Empire is made up of semi-independent princes who elect the Holy Roman Emperor. So under the Peace of Augsburg, is it the princes that determine the religion or is it the Holy Roman Emperor? The Peace of Augsburg does not say. So this is going to be a major problem after 1555. And during the Reformation, secular lords, secular authorities, are going to start to supersede that of the church. When it comes to defending the church, it is not really going to be the Pope and high church authorities that take a central role in defending the Catholic faith. Instead, it's going to be men like Charles V and his son, Philip II. And there my dryer is going off again. Again, I apologize. And of course, with men like Charles V and then later Philip II, using the Catholic religion as a bludgeon against their political enemies, this will make religious leaders 
and secular leaders that oppose Spain decide with not only Spain's enemies but also those outside of the Catholic Church. So it's going to accelerate the breakdown of the Catholic religion in Europe, but also help bring Spain down as the most powerful empire and most influential force in Europe. And so next class period, we're going to talk about the rise of secular kingdoms in Europe. Mainly, we're going to talk about the rise of England and France as the most powerful influences, most powerful powers in Europe. And also, we're going to talk about the, the fall of Spain. So, what's the social impact of, of uh, the Reformation? We see the fragmentation of the Universal Church of the West. We see the questioning of authority. We see the decline of the status of the church being superseded by that of secular authorities like kings. We also see open rebellion like the Peasants' Revolt of 1524 and 1525 and of course the Zurich War of the Swiss Civil War that we already saw before. Now, going back to this map right here, this is the reign of Charles V. As you can see, Spain, the Netherlands, Austria, the lower part, he, he was also king of Naples, and Holy Roman Emperor. So Charles V at this time is the most powerful man in Europe. However, with Charles V and later his son, Philip II, using faith as a political tool, it's going to cause tension. And it's this tension, this dissent against Spain, which is going to play a crucial role in the rise of England. So let's preview the Reformation in England. Because the Reformation in England is going to be a top-down matter rather than a grassroots matter like that of Lutheranism. It's going to do, it's going to have more to do with political reforms than with church reforms because it's going to be tension with Spain that's really the motivating force behind England breaking away from the Catholic Church. Now what causes the Reformation quote unquote in England? Well the Reformation starts with Henry VIII. Now Henry VIII in 1521 had been given the title by the Pope of Defender of the Faith for his suppression of the Lollards. However, in 1531, Henry VIII will declare all church lands and the church itself to be separate. All church lands in England, I should say. All church lands in England to be separate from the Catholic Church. And instead of being headed by the Pope, to be headed by the Crown, to be headed by himself. So, in this 10-year span, what causes Henry VIII to go from defender of the faith to a rogue church leader? It has to do with who's going to be his heir. Who's going to inherit the throne? It has very little to do with his own personal religious beliefs. Because Henry VIII, like all monarchs, want to have a male heir. They want to keep the throne English. Well, he's married to Catherine of Aragon. He's married to a member of the house of Charles V. Catherine of Aragon has only been able to give him one daughter. No male heir. At this time, Charles... Ah, there goes the dryer again. I apologize. At this time, people like Henry VIII have no clue that it's the man who as the determining effect on gender. And of course, Henry VIII blames his wife. He wants a divorce. He actually doesn't, he wants more than a divorce. He wants what is, what is known as an annulment, to annul the marriage. And only the Pope can annul a marriage. So what is the difference between a divorce and having a marriage annulled? 
An annulment is declaring that the marriage was never valid, that it never took place. If an annulment was given, Catherine of Aragon would be a whore because she slept with Henry VIII. Her child, Mary, would be a bastard. And so Catherine of Aragon refuses, but more importantly, the Pope refuses. Because at this time, the Pope is more dependent upon Charles V than Henry VIII. Because Henry VIII's kingdom is pretty much one of the smallest and weakest kingdoms in Europe. It's a backwater. Spain, on the other hand, under Charles V, is the most powerful entity in Europe. And so, with the papal refusal of a divorce or an annulment, Henry VIII simply declares his own church. And as the head of the Anglicans, as the head of the Church of England, he can give himself his own divorce. And he does. He says, I'm divorced from you, Catherine. Go home. So, what are the lasting effects of the Reformation? Well, in the mid-1600s, the Holy Roman Empire and parts of France will descend into what amounts to a religious civil war. This is known as the Thirty Years' War. We'll talk about this next lecture period, but I just wanted to introduce it. We see the fragmentation of Europe, not just along political lines, but along religious lines as well. We will also see Protestant countries being be opposing Catholic countries. So we see Switzerland and England as the leading Protestant countries vying off against Germany and Austria and France. And as I've already told you, the Reformation is going to signal the decline of Spain. And then finally, the most obvious lasting effect of the Reformation is the continuing pro proliferation of Christian denominations. So next class period, we're going to talk about the rise of England and modern secular nation states. We're also going to talk about the crises that are involved with these, these new secular states and how the wars and crises involved between these nation states help create the modern Europe we now know. I will see you guys on Monday.